offer you this lesson from Unity of the Keys Spiritual Center. Today's talk is hashtag present perfect. What does that mean? Well, if you're one of the about 75 people who opened their weekly e-blast this week, you had a hint that hashtag present perfect is an online campaign, one that they run each year, inviting youth across the U.S., and Canada, inviting LGBTQ youth and their parents to a faith community that is LGBTQ affirming. That's us. That's us 24-7. We've got that covered. Today, we are joining almost 250 other churches holding this same message, standing in this same space. We are gathered together this morning in spirit with Lutherans and Episcopalians and Presbyterians and United Methodist, with Unitarian Universalist. There's some Baptists and Catholics on that list as well. United Church of Christ and, of course, our cousin Centers for Spiritual Living. And I'm proud to say that Unity Churches comprise almost 20% of those that today ha are giving this same message, this message that you are perfect just as you are. Last year, this campaign reached half a million people through social media. It's, the message is important. It's essential. It's a message we all want to hear. It's a message that we all need to remind ourselves and one another. And so what does this, this mean, this perfect perfection? Who gets to define it? Who gets to decide what that is? And how many of us have tried to be perfect? For when we're little, we want to fit in. We want to fit in that family unit and our you know, our family of origin quite often is concerned. They want us to fit in. They want us to be able to exist in the world and not be too much different than everyone else. They want us to not feel pain. And then there's our society that really wants us to be cookie cutters, for they want to sell us every product in the world so that we can be perfect. We drink the right wine. We eat the right food. We drive the right car. And so we might try. We might try for that perfect house and the perfect car, the perfect spouse, and the perfect body. And then the realization comes in that things change. And that perfect house deteriorates or becomes outdated or gets blown away in a hurricane. That perfect car, we can all identify with coming home with a new or new-to-us car. Remember when you first get it, you park way out in the back. You don't want anybody to bump it or scratch it. But sooner or later, that perfect car gets a dent. And if we are in harmony in our marriage, we quickly learn to embrace one another's imperfections, to love them. And our bodies, I don't even want to go there. Change is the one constant. Change is the one constant. And so we hold this standard that is not attainable. And some people become so frustrated with that that they go the other extreme. And you know the standard's way over here. But we may continue to try to plug along towards that perfection. Dr. Brene Brown, who's a research professor and author, says that perfectionism is defeating and self-destructive simply because there's no such thing as perfect. Perfection is an unattainable goal. So if it's an unattainable goal, we set ourselves up for defeat, for failure at the very get-go. And yet we're left with feelings of shame or blame self-doubt, self-criticism, judgment. It's wise to think of the words of Ralph Waldo Emerson, written in the 1800s. 
to be yourself in a world that's constantly trying to make you something else is the greatest accomplishment. There's a Buddhist story about perfection. A priest is told that some very important guests are going to be arriving. And so he sets about out in the garden. He wants it to be truly beautiful, so he pulls weeds. He clips and trims the bushes and the trees. He even rakes the moss. And it's the fall, so leaves have fallen. He rakes them in beautifully shaped mounds. And the whole while, a monk is watching him from across the wall. So when he's satisfied with this labor of love, he turns to the monk and he says, isn't it beautiful? And the wise sage says, yes, but it's not, it's not quite right. If you will help me across the wall, I'll fix it. Well, this confuses the priest because he thinks it looks pretty good, but he helps the sage across the wall who takes his cane and walks to the center of the garden to the tree, grabs its trunk and shakes it. And all these beautiful leaves, red and russet and brown, fall to the ground. And he says, there, that's better. Now, will you help me back across the wall? So perfectionism... What perfection is, is really our own eyes, seeing through our own eyes. It's not always what we think it is. And we're so bombarded by everyone else's perfection. I mean, take Facebook. You know, Facebook, and I'm a follower, I'm a stalker. Okay, I'm a Facebook stalker. (laughs) Facebook is filled with pictures of showing you how perfect people's lives are, all their adventures, and I love seeing everything. We're seeing one side. We're seeing the glossy side. We're seeing that which is Facebook worthy. And even then, it's maybe been cropped. We don't know the whole story. This past year, around my son's birthday, I posted a picture of him. It's actually a picture of him sitting in a chair, and my arm is wrapped around his neck, and we're both smiling, and we look very happy and content. And a friend of mine shared with me that when she saw that picture, that she felt some envy come up within her because that picture reflected such harmony and such a great relationship, and she struggles with that with her own adult son. That picture could have been taken at a family reunion or some high-end resort somewhere. I shared with her that that picture was taken when my son was in Alcohol and Drug Rehab Center. That picture is no less perfect to me. That's exactly where he needed to be, and he was getting the help that he so needs, and I was happy to share that day with him. But we just don't know. We don't know the whole picture. And the truth is, we are each perfect just as we are. And yes, there may be things about ourselves that we would like to change. But in truth, in spirit, we're perfect. And going within and seeking guidance and changing our mind about ourselves and the world, we're guided to make whatever changes we desire, whatever changes we feel are are necessary so that we can be our greatest selves, so that we can express the God of our nature to our highest and to our greatest. This morning, I'm going to read some from the Gospel of Matthew. It's a very popular passage. It's in chapter 5, and here we have the Sermon on the Mount. And Jesus is teaching, teaching, teaching. He wants his disciples and his followers to listen to his very words. He says, "You you have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be children of your Father in heaven. For he makes his his son rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the righteous and on the unrighteous. For if you love those who love you, 
What reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers and sisters, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Let's look at this, verse 48. Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Now, the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is using one of his favorite teaching techniques. He is saying, you have heard it said that, but I say to you. You have heard it said that, but I say to you. It sounds very gentle, but it's actually an upheaval from the Jewish faith teachings at that time. And Jesus loved and knew the Hebrew scripture very well, and he knew that his teachings would sometimes contradict and at other times enhance the scriptures. His message of personal empowerment to go beyond the scriptures, to not just love your family, but your enemies. He was saying, that was then, this is now. This is the kingdom of heaven. He was not telling us how to act. He was telling us how to be, to be aware of our oneness in spirit, to be inclusive of everyone, to love and to not judge. Now this word that's used, the Hoini Greek word that's used in this passage, is teleos, teleos. And one interpretation of that is perfect. But the theological interpretation of that is more mature or complete. Now that takes a different flavor, doesn't it? When we look at that and say, be complete, therefore, as your heavenly Father is complete. Jesus is not saying you have to live a life that is free from any sin ever. He's not setting a standard, a ridiculously high standard that we fail to meet. We're living this world as human beings, knowing we are divine and we are always taking steps towards expressing our true nature. But we are complete. We are complete in spirit, always. Now you have may- maybe have seen, I know I have, um, challenges where you're asked, what would you say if you could give a message to your younger self? Let's say 20 years younger. Say 30 years younger. (laughs) What would that message be? The answers I have seen have been along the lines of, you're doing okay. Don't worry. Have fun. It's all going to be okay. I have never once seen someone respond with, try to fit in more. Try to be more perfect. Get a nose job. No, I've never seen anything like that. I recently read an article by a woman named Beverly that she was writing about her granddaughter Lucy. Her granddaughter Lucy was born with Down syndrome, one of the most prevalent of the birth defects. And I use this example because as we, as we have moved into this world of wanting to be perfect, each one of us have felt there was some group of defects within us that may or may not be obvious that prevented us from from being our true selves, if only it wasn't for this, that, or the other thing. Beverly shares that when her granddaughter was born, she cried buckets of tears. She was expecting this perfect little granddaughter. She cried tears, worrying about her granddaughter being rejected. She cried tears for herself, grieving the loss of a perfect little one. She was concerned that her granddaughter wouldn't be accepted, that she'd experience great pain. Of course, the doctors and the nurses are letting them know all the things that Lucy will never be able to do. She wrote this article about the time that her her granddaughter was turning 13. She has lots of friends. She had a birthday party. She had a surprise party. And this woman, Beverly, recalled her own daughter at 13, Lucy's mother. Those were not pleasant days. There was slamming of doors. There was sulking around. There was being surly. There was not speaking to the mother. Lucy has never experienced one day of that. She's a compassionate young woman 
who, if someone is in pain, will sit down next to them and pat their hand and say, it's okay, it's okay. And if they don't start cry- stop crying, she cries with them. That is who this precious girl is. And Beverly said, thinking back, if she could change time, she would say, speak her mind to those naysayers. For she could not imagine life without this beautiful granddaughter, Lucy. She read online this definition of perfect. Someone with few flaws, possessing many desirable qualities. Breathe that in. Someone with few flaws, possessing many desirable qualities. You are perfect exactly as you are. God bless you.